Hello, I'm Simon Fisher-Becker, and you're listening to the Sirens of... Oh, what was it? <laughs> oh, we'll keep that. We'll keep that one. <laughs> That's going on. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Sirens of audio, I'm really sorry. Welcome, Dalek. Why have we formed this abomination of an alliance? Have you heard of the Sirens of Audio podcast? I admit I have, but it causes me much pain. Me too. But we have been tasked with a vital mission that will ensure victory for both our empires. What is that? One of the hosts refuses to utter a specific phrase. A phrase so powerful that when uttered, it will shatter the chains holding us back from galactic conquest and allow us to crush all who oppose us. I know it. I will find Dwayne Bunny and force him to utter the words. And what are those words, Comrade Dalek? Hi there. Hi there. Hi there. Excellent. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name's Dwayne. And my name's Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. G'day Philip, how are you? I am feeling a bit tired, but I'm pretty good though. <laughs> Why would you be tired? Well, it's just very late at night. <laughs> uh, we've got to sneak out and do this podcast, guys, away from our families. Today's episode is... A very exciting one. We've got part two of our discussion with Nicholas Briggs. We're going to delve into uh, Big Finish. We In part one, we talked a lot about uh, before Big Finish, and now we're getting into Big Finish proper. So very much looking forward to that. But before we do, Philip, do you know what? No, what, Dwayne? We're not going to jump in the rabbit hole today. Oh, really? Really? I thought for a change, because we... We haven't talked about new stuff for a little while. Uh, we could go back over the last couple of months and just point out a couple of new Big Finish releases that uh, uh, have really stood out to me and see whether you agree with me or not. You may not have even heard them yet. I don't know. Or you may have listened to something that I haven't heard yet. So I thought I'd start off by just going back to the month of May. And the release there, The War Doctor Begins, Battlegrounds was released. And I've just got to say that Jonathan Carley never ceases to amaze me with the way he gets the War Doctor's voice so perfectly. Uh, and I love Ken Bones on the cover, so he's he's always appealing to me. Um, and this set was uh, uh, has been a real highlight for me over the last couple of days because I was behind Philip and I've uh, only just listened to it. And I can highly highly recommend this one have you had a chance to hear this one yet i must confess the first box set was brilliant and fantastic and i just haven't got to this one yet so it's sitting there waiting to listen to but unfortunately it hasn't quite got there yet so i'll um, get onto it soon though have you got anything you've heard uh, that you wanted to recommend so are we in may what month are we in may looking? may i'm gonna start off by um heroes and villains in blake seven Mm -hmm. So this is a box set with um, Sally Navette and Jan Chapel, and they're being linked back up with different villains from the show's past. And so um, you've got um, the Armagons, which was a really bad Blake 7 episode, um, where Jenna sort of tries to portray Blake and the crew, but it's all, all a facade. Um, and so you've got them back in it. That, yeah, so Blake 7 episode was awful, but this was really good. Um, but there's a really excellent story with Dorian. So 
Um, the fourth season of Blake Seven starts with the, the, the crew who have survived of Terminus being taken off to being collected by a man called Dorian, who Sulin's working for, and he tries to turn them all into this creature that's going to extend his life. Where they first meet him, um, before that episode happens in this story, and that's a really clever one by Mark B. Oliver. Um, and then there's also another one, which is um, with Snyder. It's always Shrinker. Um, so in the wonderful episode, Black Seven episode, with Anna Grant, um, called Rumours of Death, um, we find out who, who betrayed Avon at the very beginning of the whole Black Seven series. But it starts off with him being tortured by this torture called Shrinker, and you see his end there. But this is actually an earlier episode where you see Shrinker in action as well. So it taps, taps into the original show in a really clever way. It uses Jenna and Callie cleverly throughout. And yeah, so just I, I just really, really love what they've been doing with this Blake 7 range. It's very hard when you've lost a lot of the cast, but they're still being really creative in what they're doing. So just, just loving so, that. So how are you coping with the recasting of these characters as well? Um, they're all, all recast, aren't they, the villains? Yes, all the, all pretty sure all the villains were recast. I didn't really notice that it happened. I think because they're only one offs in in single stories, it's it's yeah. I, I don't think it's that striking. Um, I mean, I guess one that had to recast them because you know at least one, well, maybe a couple of them are dead now actually. Um, yeah, no, I I don't mind the recastings. I've I've actually got quite used to it. In in you know, I'm even coping with it with major characters. Um, the other one thing I want to pull out in actually there's a few others in this month, but also the, the robots um, number five because I think the robot series is just astounding where it's taken us to. One more box set to go. I'm not sure what's coming out, but I'm I'm really January going to miss I think Jan is it? Um, I I'm just adoring the robots. I think it's been one of the best new series creations that um, Big Fish have done. And also yeah, the, the Sherlock Holmes I've talked about before. I'm pretty sure the Fiends of New, new York City. You have. You did last uh, Nick Briggs episode. Last week, yeah. Brilliant. So let's move on to June. And the standout for me would have to be the fourth Doctor box set, The Nine, uh, particularly the story written by Guy Adams called The Dreams of Avarice. Now, The Nine, The Eleven, The Twelve, fascinating, fascinating character uh, this time on. So it's good to explore uh, him in a in, in more detail here. And... Um, Yeah, Guy Adams has gone all out. I think it's been a while since we've heard a story from Guy Adams, hasn't it? He was unwell for a very long time, so he's obviously getting better again, which is good. Yeah, so it was... The mind, this may have been done a long time ago. Yeah, I think it was done a while back, but um, yeah, it's great great to hear again. And um, this year's Fourth Doctor box sets are uh, very, very enjoyable. Uh, I think I probably preferred the first one, Blood of the Time Lords in particular. That's probably my favourite Fourth Doctor story of this year so far, but this box set is also very, very solid. Did you get a chance to hear that one, Philip? I did. I think it's a brilliant box set, so I concur. It's, it's a great highlight of the month. Um, though I'm going to pick something else, I'm going to actually pick the Seventh Doctor adventure, Silver and Ice. Uh, this is, I think, this is some of the best Seventh Doctor stories we've had for a long time. I just adored these stories. They're clever and funny, and I guess <laughs> the recasting question comes in again here. I don't care. Um, but in terms of Sylvester McCoy and um, Bonnie Langford, those two are just amazing off it with each other. Um, these are the these are the shows we could have kept going with. It's the style of season twenty four, but done better. Don't be don't be put off by that. It is just really fun and putting the Cybermen in there. Uh, what was it? And it's called Bad Day in Tinseltown. It's a typical yeah. season twenty four title as well. Dan Starkey is a really good writer and. I hope we get more from from Dan. He's done lots and lots of good scripts in the past, and I'm I'm sure he'll do more. Uh, but the Reboss Inheritance too, a real a real fun story, and it's great to get back to that planet. There's always something a little bit magical about the Reboss operation for me. Yeah, I've always loved that story. So to get a sequel is uh, is is really cool. And uh, yeah, we've got the the characters back from the Reboss operation as well. Well, at least one of them. And there's, there's one more there, but it's going to be my recommendation at the end of the program. So I'll leave that one. So I think for you and I, Philip, this next recommendation would be a snap. Uh, the release of July would have to be Beyond the War Games. Oh, that's for uh, sure. Snap. Yeah. Michael Troughton in his first full 
box set, his first full outing as the Doctor set. Uh, well, sh should we spoil it? Well, beyond it is set beyond the war game, so they do it in a a very interesting and satisfying way. And the two stories here are absolutely brilliant. We've got Michael Troughton as the second Doctor. A little bit different. Like, he always said that he didn't want to be an impersonation of his dad. But he's got, just like Sadie Miller, he's got the genetic uh, inflections there that you can't help but know that he's a Troughton. Oh, he, sa you? he sounds so much like his dad. And I, I know he says he's not trying to do an impersonation, but he's just sounds He so just can't much, help it. <laughs> no, it, it is just, there are times when I totally forget it's not Patrick because it just sounds so much like him. And just the energy and the enthusiasm and the love of life and the way he plays off different characters. It's, yeah, it's... I love the second Doctor. Uh, you know, the second Doctor is my favourite Doctor. Um, and this has really captured the best of that entire era, but also modernised it as well. Um, Michael Trout is breathtaking. John Coleshaw is astounding as the Brigadier. As always. Uh, I, 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 I cannot believe it's not Nicholas Briggs. It, it throws me that it's not... Um, and I miss Nicholas Briggs, what a wonderful actor. But it's just, yeah, it is just gorgeous. And Do you mean both... Nicholas Courtney? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm saying Nicholas Briggs is up next, and he wrote this, and he wrote the first story um, with Mark Wright. So it's a co-credit this time with, with Mark Wright, which yeah, I'd be curious to know how how they did it between them. And then Andrew Smith. I mean, you could not ask for three better writers to introduce this new box set, and it is it's, it's amazing. Uh, the Final Beginning is the name of the first part. So not only is it a, sort of an epilogue to the Sixth Doctor era, it is also a sequel to another story. And if you just think about that title, you are going to work out the uh, the, the story that it is a, also a sequel of during the Second Doctor's era. So Katie Manning's in there playing a playing a, a great part as one of the Ice Warriors too. She's amazing. Uh, as as she's... only Katie Manning can. You know oh. it's her, but oh, she's wonderful. Well, she's see, wonderful. I, I don't, I don't, know. I didn't know it was her. She's just oh, spect... of course you do. She is spectacular. Just adored her performance. Yeah, she's wonderful. But that that is certainly the the box set of of July, and um, we're only just over halfway through the year, so there's lots and lots of good stuff to come. Mm. So. Let me throw in a trailer for uh, Beyond War Games, uh, the new Second Doctor Adventures, and we'll be back for the second part of our in-depth chat with Nicholas Briggs. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, the Second Doctor Adventures, Beyond War Games. You have been content merely to observe the evil in the galaxy. I have been fighting against it. Sorry, don't forget me. I just got trapped here, like you. Exterminate! Uh, hello! Oh! Who are you? Oh, what a big gun you've got! I see. You mean. I'll cease to exist. As you are now. Are you or are you not the doctor that I met during the Yeti business? Is this your ship? Uh, well, no. I suppose not. This planet was slap bang in the middle of our warp conduit. Curious. You're telling me. You're not I'm not James Bond, you know. Where is your communication device? <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Loud and clear, Doctor. We complete the attack run. Bombard the surface! Is this your new, uh, companion? I'm no one's companion, thank you very much. The TARDIS is, uh, hmm, temperamental like that. <laughs> and at the moment, I'm, uh, well... <clears throat> Not exactly a free agent. Are you receiving Great Dane One? Greyhound, Doctor. Oh, oh, I do beg your pardon. Big finish for the love of stories. When we were speaking with Gary a little mm. while ago, uh, he was telling us about a famous writers' meeting that took place 
uh, in the early days of Big Finish. What are your memories of that meeting? <laughs> well, my memories of that meeting was that it was in Gary Gillett's living room in his flat somewhere in southeast London. And uh, I wonder what Gary said about it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> everyone who was interested in writing Doctor Who was there, including Stephen Moffat. Who, you know, I only relatively recently discovered was um, is, is slightly younger than me. Um, but, you know, I remember thinking at the time, someone's br who's brought their dad along? Because <laughs> he just oh. he had the demeanor of a much older man, you know much more successful than the rest of us. He had a, he, you know what I mean? I felt we were all, we all still looked a bit like teenagers, whereas he looked, you know, like someone's dad, really, which I think he probably was. Um, not someone in the room, I hasten to add. That This was the moment, this meeting was the moment when I realised that Doctor Who fandom is full of loads of different opinions and not all of them particularly good about me. And... Um, and I'd, it's awful to report it in a way because it's going to involve Paul Cornell, who is a really nice human being. And he and I have uh, sort of spoken about this and made our peace about it. So it's all fine. But if you're asking for the historical accuracy, when they announced that I was writing the first story, Paul Cornell said it needs someone really special to write it. And frankly, darling, that ain't you, is what he said to me, which was devastating. And, uh, and the whole room just froze because it was so, I mean, but you see, it was from Paul's heart and he thought you should be getting Terence Dix to write this for goodness sake. I mean, who is Nick Briggs for God's sake? And, you know, all valid points, I think. And I think it just, as happens with we Doctor Who fans, you know, the truth just of what we feel just comes up and we go, oh, no, I hated that episode. Oh, I love that episode. Oh, well, this, you know, we just get very impassioned. And that's what just bubbled up from him. I mean, I think he was also thinking I would be better. Paul Cornell would be a better choice, you know, because he'd been massively successful with all the novels. And I hadn't, I wasn't part of that world. And so from his point of view, I was just some weird bloke from several fields away who just wandered in and they say and nick briggs is writing i think well you know um how, how many audio visual scripts had you written by that stage though because you've written a lot uh approximately 15 million i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you know it was I mean, a, I mean, lot. a lot of a lot of them become big finished scripts along the way so i mean there is a lot Some there that you yeah 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 I mean, i've that's... certainly drawn on that that influence so yeah that is what happened there and it was um and also <laughs> stephen moffat got up and walked out as well in the middle of the meeting. He just got to walk through everyone. Oh, I'm not interested. <laughs> it's just making such a huge statement. Um, That's because they hadn't got Paul McGann. Is that right? I think so. I think he'd, he, when we said that we we're going to do it with Colin Sylvester uh, and uh, Peter, he, uh, I, he just thought it was too retrospective. You know, he just thought you've got to do a new, thing you've got to pick up whoever is the latest doctor and of course we'd failed to do that um so uh yeah he just thought i'm out really and i think he had bigger fish to fry you know you meet people at various points in their career like i remember who was the chap who was in um you know daleks in manhattan who went on to play spider-man andrew garfield yeah andrew garfield you see there he was playing a fairly small part in a doctor who story but he had an air about him that it, it's it's like he had a big sign on his head saying Hollywood this way. You know, you just knew it about him. And, you know, when he was stuck in a car going back from the set with Barnaby Edwards, Nick Pegg and myself, all completely being driven bonkers during the day, them being locked in a Dalek all day, not together, that would be strange. Um, uh, and just making up silly rhymes and things. And I just remember seeing Andrew kind of just gazing out of the window. <laughs> and you could tell he was thinking, one day I won't have to put up with this. You know? <laughs> and, and I think it was a bit like that with Stephen at that point. I mean, he had so much great stuff ahead of him and uh, was on the cusp of it all and had achieved quite a lot already. You know, he, he was just, yes, it, it, it was nice that he came along. And he is a lovely man. I've spent many lovely hours with him since. But yeah, it is funny to look back on that. And it was um, Justin Richards uh, was lovely. 
after all that, he said, I want you to write a, after he'd heard Sirens of Time, he said, I want you to write a Doctor Who book. You know, I really, I I really love what you do. So, you know, and he, and I think he had a sense that I'd been treated quite roughly at that meeting. I remember shrinking into the sofa, like, oh God, this is terrible. Did you, you knew beforehand that Gary was had Gary already asked you to do it, so you were. Oh yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Oh, We'd yeah. already arranged it. I mean, you must have. Gary must have told you the story of how it happened. He came. Gary came around to the flat on one of those many occasions where he just turned up, and he said, "We're going to do Doctor Who," because we'd already been doing um, Bernie Summerfield, and we'd asked to do Doctor Who, and they'd said no. So we sort of knew it was, you know, in the air. Um, but yeah, it's a couple of years later, and he said, "We're going to do Doctor Who." And I went, oh, and he went, yeah, yeah, I know you want to write it. Well, you can't um, because um, it can only be uh, experienced Doctor Who writers, people who've written Doctor Who books or the TV series. And I went, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I know how to write audio things. And he said, well, you know, no. He said, directing, yes, you know, um, sounds and stuff, music, yeah, yeah, all that, all that. And I think he said he wanted me to direct them all at that point. And I said, well, don't you want to have a go? And he went, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Um, and then he went home and I'd all, I already had come up with what was essentially the idea for the Sirens of Time. <laughs> um, and uh, I, then Gary phoned me. And I don't know what had happened. I don't remember the details. Maybe he told you, maybe you can tell me what he said, but he had had a conversation or had a thought and he'd, he said, look, actually, I, th- I think you can write, write it, maybe write the first one because he'd realized that if he got anyone else to do it, the secret would leak out. And he thought, well, I'm part of the sort of inner circle, get Nick to do it. If he's so keen to do it. I said, well, I've already come up with an idea. He said, yeah, I knew you would have done. It was only five <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> So, so tell us about that inner circle. Like when I think back on those times, I often think that Gary, Jason, they were big finish. But what was your role in those early days? Were you a freelancer or uh, something? Yeah, I more? mean, I was a freelancer for Big Finish for for many years. But yeah, I was, um, and I suppose so was Gary. Actually, uh, I suppose I regarded myself as part of the sort of three i know i've got an old contract that never got enacted i don't think when when we started doing the bernie summerfield stuff and it was meant to be me jason and gary would sort of be the joint owners of all the the audio stuff produced you know i was quite surprised to i noticed there was no signature on it so if jason's watching this <laughs> what no don't worry jason it never got signed i hate to to be immodest but the way big finish was set up in terms of production it was all that all came from me because of you know the way we did audio visuals you know i'd worked out how audio visuals should be done and how much time you should spend in a studio per script and all that and that's exactly how big finish was worked out because you know i because i said that's how audio drama is made and we just kind of did that because i thought it was a good idea and no no one else did you know whenever we uh, or no one else knew rather um uh, and and when we had a you know wanted to get a new studio uh, gary would say to me well i don't know nick you go and have a look and tell me whether it's any good or not you know and it, that would be my decision because you know i allegedly knew about things like that so i think i i certainly r- regarded myself as as very much you know part of the team of three people but you're right it was you know gary was the producer and jason was i don't know what he was credited as but producer as well i expect um yeah and they were at the heart of it and i did go off and do other things i did go off and do theater and other other jobs i suppose but you know more and more my um commitment was to big finish really as an ongoing thing but i mean i thought you know jason tells the story of how he thought oh we might be able to do it for a couple of years or something producing six a year but i i don't know stupidly but turns out rightly believed that this would run and run and run it never occurred to me that it would ever finish i thought well we're doing doctor who now and the only thing that will stop us doing doctor who is if we get fed up with it or the bbc say you can't do it anymore you know i just it never occurred to me that it might be something that would end. So, so the Sirens of Time, you wrote, you acted in it, you directed it, you did the music and the soundscape. 
So it was a, a quiet. <laughs> I didn't do the cover you. though. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in terms of, was it just because you experienced with audiovisuals, made the Gary just handed you everything? Is it you're a total control freak? And you couldn't let go of it. Um, <laughs> Why, why, how did you end up doing so much for that first production? And let's face it, you've gone on to it with, with many other very successful mm. stories along the way too. What, what is it about you that makes you want to do so much? Well, because it's all part of the same job. And if you can do it, then then why not? Um, and I think it was it solved so many problems. You know, it, I'd done, I, I had directed and done the sound design and music for some Bernie Summerfield things as well. And so just writing as well, it was just one extra job, really. And that solved a problem for Gary. You know, he could get on with planning the next one and say, oh, we'll get Alistair, to, Alistair Locke to do the post-production and, and on that. And, you know, and he knew I'd want to do it. And he knew I had the time to do it as well. Um, I don't think at any point I demanded to do it. As I say, Gary was more or less saying that I should direct them all to start with, but I knew that wouldn't be sustainable. So is there and a different knew... paycheck for each part? Do you get paid as a director to fully do it? you get paid for the music? or Yeah, of course. Yeah, you get paid for the jobs you do. I mean, I have to stress that the money was very, very low. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. But Gary was very good at uh, sorting out with Jason, you know, things about royalties and... and and on all that kind of business, he very much had the welfare of the freelancer in mind, um, which I'm very grateful for. Now, in terms of in terms of storytelling, I mean, you are an amazing storyteller in so many different Thank aspects, you. and each part of what we've talked about is a, a part of the storytelling: the music, the sound design, mm. the, the the director. Is do you think there's a, a role in an audio that is the crucial role to making sure the story works? What, just one role? Well, it, 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 well, would, can you rank them? Is it, is it important or is, does, it have to, <laughs> does it have to blend together? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, you know, I'm not saying anything particularly original. It has to start with the script. The, the script has to be, you know, the script to my mind, and I suppose I, I do occasionally get cross with other writers because it doesn't, a lot of them it doesn't occur to, but the script is the blueprint for the production. Now, I know that there's a thing that's grown up in the industry, in the proper grown up industry, where in the script, you don't make it too prescriptive because you have to leave it for the director's interpretation or for 15 different script editors to waste your time over several months. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I believe that when you write a script, and Barnaby Edwards says this, uh, and I've nicked it off him, that, you know, your first draft is your final draft. Now, that doesn't mean that it won't get rewritten and changed, but you should deliver it as the best you can do and the, not leave any of it to chance, not think, oh, well, that'll get worked out in the other drafts. You know, and one of the biggest compliments I was paid uh, was from Scott Hancock, and I don't know whether he meant it as a compliment or not, but he said to me, I think the first time he ever directed a script that had been written by me was the first War Master one. And he said, my God, you leave no stone unturned. See? And I went, oh, what, sorry? And he went, no, no, I mean, it's good. He said, but I'm absolutely certain what's going on because you you put everything in, you describe every single sound effect, not in masses of detail, but I say the key thing in writing drama is the order in which it happens. You know, you don't just say, oh, these people say these things and stuff like this happens during the scene. You say when it happens, because that is the difference between real life and drama. Drama happens in a certain order. Real life often always happens at the same time. And if you put that into drama, it's just confusing and no one knows what's going on. So you have to work out when the punch is thrown, who reacts to it, what happens when they're hit, who comes through the door, when they come through the door. They can't come through the door at the same time as the person throwing the punch. They have to come in a split second afterwards. So you register it. Drama has an order that life doesn't have. But you put enough, um, for want of a nicer word, fake confusion in there to make people feel they are um, experiencing something very like real life. But that that is the difference. And I think the clearer the script is, th the better it is for the director, for the sound designer, 
and for the composer as well and for the and for goodness sake for the actors as well although actors are notorious for not reading uh, the stage directions they just read their lines tom baker is always and i say if you notice that bit there tom it says you've just fallen down the stairs well i don't read those bits <laughs> you know <laughs> i don't like to pry he says you know i said well no it's helpful sometimes tom well if you say so um so uh, yeah it, it is the blueprint and and the better the blueprint the better the final production and you know and if if you if there are things wrong with the script at least the writer has given it their best shot and then you can adjust accordingly, you know. Now, Dwayne and I have a bit of a love affair with Maggie Stables. <laughs> so I'm assuming the fact that you directed her in The Sirens of Time means mm. you, you actually were the first to employ her and bring it into Big Finish? Um, I think she might have done a Benny beforehand that I... I'm not sure, though. I'm not sure of the time. Oh, you're right. She, she, was I, in, she did the war one, didn't she? She was in Just war. war. Yeah. Just War. I always Just have war. to make that joke. Um just war uh i always thought that title always just sounded like just war just war <laughs> what is it it's just war <laughs> just war a just or maybe the word a in front might have helped anyway um or maybe it's a play on words and i've missed the point i probably have uh maggie is an old friend of mine from theater work and i one way or another yes i did suggest her the big finish even though i may not have directed her first uh, and that's certainly gary after having sort of experienced her work and met her several times you know it was his idea to to cast her as evelyn smythe that was one of his master plans that he he came up with i think while he was at gallifrey one the convention you know and he came back from that saying what we're going to do we're going to have this companion and i just thought well i can't disagree with that it's a fantastic idea maggie was one of the most um lovely human beings and you know i was in touch with her you know right up until quite close to her death and uh, uh yeah she she meant a lot to me <laughs> she's she she came to acting very late in life actually i think she'd already sort of retired um but she had a i mean i'm struggling here because there's so many things I want to tell you about Maggie, but all of them are just far too outrageous. <laughs> oh, tell, just... tell them. They're too bad. We'll edit them out later. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favourite memories of Maggie is when I was on tour uh, in a production with her in as well. And um, on a couple of occasions, she, uh, a chap called James Campbell, who was a very dear friend of mine, who I haven't seen for years and years and years, uh, and I shared digs. Um, we didn't share digs for the whole tour, but every now and again, we'd say, oh, well, let's, there's, we can get three in here. Let's go there. And um, Maggie would say, oh, and we, we'd love to share with Maggie because she'd bring all this fantastic food. She'd bring casseroles and things in her car. And she, she'd provide us with amazing food. And she loved a glass of wine. And I remember one evening after her fantastic um, food, and we'd had far too much wine. <laughs> and um, <laughs> James was... Um, uh, public school educated so you know very polite very adept in social situations uh, outrageous and, and camp and funny but you know what I mean and uh, whereas I'm a bit of an oaf socially I'm, I quite often say the wrong thing or I'm too quiet or too loud and never quite right you know um, and I, I'd got very drunk and we were discussing all this in the kitchen afterwards after the meal and uh, we were all drunk and I said uh, I said, the thing about you, James, is that you're just so brilliant with people and you just put people at their ease and they're, and they're polite and people like you. I said, was, was I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a complete, uh, uh, and, and Maggie was just drinking. She went, wanker. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I remember falling <laughs> to my knees, laughing. I just couldn't get up. I would just like, crash to my knees. And then we were all howling like mad. Of course, it all seemed a lot funnier because we were drunk. Um, and I wouldn't recommend that, kids. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, that was one of my best memories. And also, if someone um, uh, in a rehearsal situation uh, used incorrect grammar, whilst talking to the director or something. And she'd be sitting there doing the Times crossword with the, the paper up in front of her face. And she'd just shout the correction out, you know, 
if someone said less instead of fewer, she go fewer. Or if they said uh, schedule instead of schedule, she go schedule. You know, and actors would go, uh, sorry, pardon, um, what? <laughs> She'd just shout out corrections because she used to be a teacher as well. And I remember James Campbell used to because Maggie had had this sort of incredible list of jobs. He used to tell people that she was once president of France as well. <laughs> She'd say, uh, he'd say, oh, please meet uh, Maggie Stables, former president of France. Um, <laughs> she was just adorable, so much fun and so down to earth. And uh, and what's that, that thing? Um, you know, the um, she was a pearly queen as well. Does that mean anything to you guys? No, not at <laughs> not all. A thing. Well, <laughs> look it up, folks. I think it's a lovely touch that uh, that the character of Evelyn's been brought back in via Hebe, the new Sixth Doctor companion. I think that's yeah. a beautiful touch. Uh, it's well, brought back all the nice feels for for, for Maggie uh, in that box set when I heard that. Well, and you know, Jack Rayner is to really be commended for all that. I mean, you know, she's an incredible writer, a lovely, lovely human being. Um, and uh, it's brilliant to have her doing that and for her to have created the character of Hebe. You know, she was straight, when we gave her the job, she said, I want to do this. And she gave us the character. And we thought, well, now this, this is the good stuff. This is brilliant. And we're always looking for people to bring new ideas and, you know, easy to say yes to that one. So in, in those early years of Big Finish, you had some passion projects too, Dalek Empire, Cyberman, um, these were were these ideas that you were trying to get out there for a long time? Uh, no, they were ideas that I came up with and luckily found a good reception for them. I think the Dalek Empire one was a bit sneaky because I think Gary went away and um, Jason Green lit it while Gary was away. <laughs> and Gary came back and found pages on the website. Like, oh, what's going on here? I mean, Gary had already come up with the overarching title of Dalek Empire for a whole bunch of Doctor Who stories. And I said, yeah, I'd really, to start with, I wanted to adapt the Dalek book, you know, the big old blue uh, annual from the uh, 60s. And then I just found, you know, it, its relationship towards science was so remote <laughs> that I found, I thought, oh, this is just sort of a bit too childlike, really, although I do absolutely adore it. So I sort of created something in the image of it, I think. And Jason was extremely supportive because basically we didn't have the rights for the Daleks for the first year. That took extra negotiation. And once that was sorted, we sort of went hell for leather for the Daleks, which have always um, done very well for Big Finish. I was going to ask you in terms of your obsession with the Daleks, how did, how did your obsession come about? Is that a fair word to use? I suppose so. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, there's something about, uh, I I loved, I did love the voice. It's incredible to think now that that's, that strangeness to them and the fact that they were sort of totally evil. There's, there's some, there's something so, you know, bizarrely reassuring about an element of a story that is so defined and it defines your heroic characters. Um, you know, when the, when the, um, the bad guys are so unrelentingly evil and there's no possibility of kindness or compromise from them. Um, but yeah, as a kid and just everything that's cool about them, I'm, I, I noticed, Philip, you know, behind you, there are the Daleks. Is that from Eve of the Daleks? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I thought you'd know what picture you'd selected on your computer. You, well, I, you I grabbed the modern I, I made sure I grabbed modern Daleks that you'd voiced. That's what I grabbed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Um, you know, it's just such a cool design, and they just seem to, yeah, they're just such a brilliant story element, and I was always thrilled to see them and, uh, you know, as a kid and, and to hear them and to, you know, and I used to try and impersonate the voice and couldn't understand why it didn't sound right because I didn't have a ring modulator, folks. Um, I used to try shouting distortion and everything, all of which is a good part of a Dalek voice. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things that that clicked really. And, it, you know, and I wasn't alone, was I? Dalek mania. And then when the series came back, the whole Dalek thing took off. I remember I went to so many events because the Dalek toy was the, the most popular toy that year. And you know what I mean? It, there's, it's, like all really brilliant things, it's almost impossible to 
define in words exactly why they're brilliant, but it just, the fact that it happened twice as well, there were two lots of Dalek mania, weren't there? There's the Dalek mania in the 60s and then the Dalek mania that happened, uh, you know, in, in the mid 2000s. Quite, quite remarkable. What would you say is the um, your voice of choice? It's not yours, of course. Classic series. What's 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 the Dalek show? If you say, yeah, that's the Dalek voice. That's what because they're all so different. They are. That's a, yeah. A lot of not a lot of people realise that. I mean, I, I I suppose my favourite. Well, I was reminded the other day when uh, David Tennant was answering questions, and he said he doesn't like to do favourites because it always seems disloyal to any of the other options. And I think that's a really good point, actually, because by saying favourite, it almost sounds like you're saying Every, everything else in this list is rubbish. And I'm not saying that, but uh, Peter Hawkins. Uh, voice was the original Dalek and and David Graham says that Peter Hawkins was the guy who was originating the voice and he kind of did his own version of that and you know David Graham was the other Dalek voice right at the beginning for those of you who don't know and so I suppose I'm most at home doing that good mid-range Peter Hawkins voice but I love all the you know and I've created a few Dalek voices of my own, but I am always nodding towards the classic voices, you know, Roy Skelton, uh, who had that great guttural quality to his voice anyway, you know, uh, which didn't, you know, it, which the ring, mo that's the brilliant thing about the ring modulator. It emphasizes any difference in your voice. So you only have to alter your voice ever so slightly to sound like a completely different Dalek. And with uh, Roy Skelton's voice, that guttural quality that goes into it, you know, really does that and the ring modulator reacts brilliantly and you get really fearsome Daleks. I mean, he was great in Evil of the Daleks, but then they went mad with the modulation in that. They kind of set it at a much higher rate. And it's uh, that those, um, I mean, we, I experimented with that in the upcoming Second Doctor uh, adventures where I made sure that the Dalek voices sounded more like the Evil of the Daleks voices because it seemed to fit with the story, but not wanting to give too much away there. <laughs> When Gary left Big Finish mm -hmm. and you came and took over, took over, it was a well, hostile takeover. That's a whole thing there. But anyway. Well, so how, well, how did that happen? What was the whole thing there? <laughs> he's, he's onto it. He's onto it. Um, well, the whole thing was that um, quite some time before Gary left, he actually expressed to me, he used that old phrase that... Um, Terence Dix liked to use. He said, I feel hooed out, he said. And he started to go into kind of slow motion. And um, there'd been a number of opportunities for me to have that role in the past because Gary had done a couple of resignations. I want to say three, actually, but maybe it was just two. I don't know where, where something had frustrated him and he decided he'd had enough. And on those occasions... Uh, I think Jason, you know, wanted Gary to continue, but he would come to me and say, I'm assuming you'd like to take over if Gary stopped doing this. And on all those occasions, I said, no way. It's a terrible job. I can see how much it stresses him. And, I, you know, I used to see that, you know, I used to share an office with Gary and I used to see the light of that office on very late at night when I'd come staggering back from the pub or something and i think God, he's still in there working well not a drinker very wise um but you know so he would work i mean he may have been playing online pinball i did discover that once when he was uh he was looking concentrating on his computer very hard and i thought i don't want to interrupt him he's probably a bit busy and then the noise of the um, online people and i looked at him and he just went i said busted he went busted yeah what do you want <laughs> you know? um uh so he did he slowed down and then he was getting um invited to um apply for a script editor's job at the at the bbc and he uh, i don't think i uh, apologies now gary if you're watching this i'm sure you know if you're saying you can't be bothered i don't think i'm doing you a disservice but you had real imposter syndrome about it and resisted it and eventually they got you an interview without you applying for the job. So I'm talking to Gary now. Um, <laughs> and, and I remember when he, when that happened, he said to me, now I'm really scared, but he got the job. So it's fantastic. Now he couldn't do that and 
run Big Finish as well. I think he had an idea that he might be able to do both. And I remember thinking, that's that's just not going to fly. Plus the fact, this sounds like I'm involving some form of emotional blackmail, plus the fact that my father had just recently died. And I, you know, when something like that happens in your life, you start to ask yourself who you are and what you're doing and what is the point of anything. And it's made me think, and I remember talking to John Ainsworth and, and I said, I'm thinking that maybe if, if we could redefine the role in some way, maybe I have something to offer. And John Ainsworth said to me, I do, I do think you've got something to offer, Nick, and I think you should go for it. So I said to Jason, I think I've got a plan of, of how I'd like to do this if, you know, if, Gar if Gary does leave. And, um, and I can't remember the exact sequence of events, but um, I know that, you know, Gary did sort of behave a bit like I'd usurped him, even though he left and there was a job and I took it. But we redefined it, actually. Jason said to me, he said, looking at the TV series, what they've got there is two executive producers. And then you've got loads of producers and other people who are making all the stuff. Uh, and directors and he said oh, i wonder whether we you know we could get in a line producer for you uh, and then you could do the executive producer job from the creative point of view and i'd be the other exec from the business point of view and i said i think that's a really good idea so there was a line producer came in called sharon gosling uh, and that worked quite well for for a time but but later on we got um uh, david richardson in and the, and the rest there is history but that's that's how it happened. Um, what was the question? <laughs> when you came in, what was your first order of business? Was there stories on the go that you decided to shelve and go on with a new direction? What did you, did you have your own brand new vision? What did you want to do? Sure. Um, the order of business was to get some order into it because, you know, um, Gary had slowed right down. And I, and one of the, I remember now, one of the reasons that i put myself forward as I said to Jason, we are going to fall off a cliff here because there's not enough in the can. Um, so it was, it, it really, it was quite desperate. We were running out of things that have been recorded that could be put out. And so immediately what I had to do was make sure we didn't have a blank as, as uh, Terence Sticks would have said, a blank screen. You know, we didn't have a blank month. That was the real struggle back in those days to try and make sure that something came out. I had to alter the order of something. Uh, Year of the Pig, I think, had been completed a long time in advance, but wasn't due to release until the following year. So I said, that's finished. That goes out now. Thank you. That will give us a month's breathing space. Um, and, uh, and there were several things that had been commissioned that I got John Ainsworth on, on to just pursuing them with the writer. And I said, and you can direct it as well. Just get that done. And it was just trying to sort out what was happening. And there were several uh, projects that had been, because Gary went through it with me. He said what had, and, and he basically showed me what I was stuck with and what I, what maneuvering room I had. And I discovered that some of what he told me was, for whatever reason, a bit inaccurate. So some people who I didn't think had been contracted had been contracted and vice versa. So it was quite a minefield, really. So I had to, uh, I worked very hard with uh, Alan Barnes, who was the script editor, to, to line up stories. Um, my first order of business in terms of wanting to change anything, I thought all the episodes had become massively too long. And that had two effects. One, that the narratives just went. I mean, you had episodes that were meant to be 25 minutes that were running to 45 minutes. So the narratives weren't tight. Everything was getting a bit flaccid. The other problem is if you put scripts that long into studio, you just don't have enough time to record them properly. You have to go, you know, like, like Mark Stritzen used to tell the story about when they were filming Doctor Who, like, bang, get up, die, get up, up, do, you know, everything was like, quick, 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 we're running out of time, you know, and it was getting like that. And so it was inefficient. So I applied the 25 minute rule, which was too stringent, really, because it became nightmarish. We now have a rule where, you know, we say they're 25 minute episodes, 
But if it goes to 35, that's it. If it's any longer than 35, then something is awry. But, you know, so it's 5,000 words per episode. And a 5,000 word script can can deliver anything from a 25 minute episode to a 35 minute episode because of the, the quirks of the way people deliver things, the way the sound design goes, you know, a sound designer may put a rocket taking off that takes five seconds rather than three or whatever, you know. Um, so that was a big thing that I wanted to do. I had a, a, a secret agenda of establishing a download service as soon as humanly possible because I could see that that was coming down the pipe towards us and we would have been out of step with the entire universe. And I wanted to find a way of getting Tom Baker on board. That again, I didn't tell anyone I was thinking that, but I started out putting feelers straight away. Most of them went nowhere for quite some time. But yeah, th those were my big priorities. Um, also to take the, the eighth doctor out of the main range because we were working on uh, the Lucy Miller stories and to establish the eighth doctor's own range. And ultimately I still had, I had the idea that's only finally come to fruition that all the doctors would have their own ranges because I was seeing how impractical it was to have, uh, you know, all, all the doctors sort of just bunched into um, one range. And, and, and randomly released in all sorts of random orders. You know, there was no pattern to how they were being released. It was whatever was ready first, really. Um, also, I wanted the, we, we started working on the trilogies, didn't we, fairly soon that each, yeah. So we, start, we started releasing them in three Be Before months that, you blocks. were putting out uh, three parts and one part stories too. Mm. I wanted to experiment with story length because I, I started to feel, especially with new Doctor Who coming in on television and showing that you could tell a great story in 45 minutes, I thought maybe the way we absorb Doctor Who now, maybe we don't want it to last so long. Maybe four 25 minute episodes, is just gonna seem horribly long. So I wanted to, I liked the idea of a three part story because it's the three acts, you know, the beginning, beginning, the middle and the end, um, you know, where you find everything, uh, you. You set up all the mysteries in the first act. You discover what it's all about in the second act, and then you act upon it in the third act, and that's the exciting uh, bit, you know. So I, uh, I don't think any of that was particularly successful, um, but they make sort of interesting. The one parters are quite interesting as well, aren't they? they you are. know, I was finding my feet. I was finding my feet and um, trying to refresh things. And we realized that, you know, with the beginning of the new TV series, and I think this was another thing that was um, uh, instrumental in Gary wanting to leave, you know, Big Finish was nowhere near the center of the Doctor Who universe anymore. And we uh, really, I, I've used this phrase before, that when I took on the job, I thought, listen, I'll just rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic for a little while and have some fun because I thought we are going down and I just, you know, but I tried to stop it from sinking and I managed to do it with the help of loads of brilliant people. And um, what we, I, I wanted to make every story a reason for people to decide to come and listen to Big Finish, maybe for the first time. It wasn't, I think, even though there were loads of brilliant uh, things going on before, um, I think they'd fallen into the trap of, of churning them out and there never being a headline grabbing reason for that story to have been released. And I wanted to, as much as possible, I'm not saying I always succeeded, but I wanted as much as possible for every release to, to be able to grab the attention, you know, and Alan Barnes said this a number of times, it might have even been his idea, but they were all to use modern marketing parlance. I wanted everything to be a tent pole, <laughs> you know, to just get people back because we had lost them. When Doctor Who arrived on television, everyone went Bleh! and went towards it and you, we didn't see him for dust. I mean, uh, oof, so the sales uh, did drop at that time? Oh, uh, horrifically. I mean, right. I think Jason seriously considered stopping it all. Um, but uh, so it was, you know, I, I arrived in a, in a atmosphere of extreme economic tension. Let's put it that way. And, you know, there was a lot of talk about budgets and changing things i even i instigated a system whereby we lost one of the recording days by sort of putting them all together and 
and so you would do uh three four part stories in one block but lose either one or two of the days in that block so they'd keep bleeding over into the next day and and by keeping the episode shorter i thought we'd be able to manage it it was horrific actually that didn't work i remember uh, lisa bauman who was directing one of these blocks you know took me into a room and whacked her finger at me <laughs> she said the trouble with you people <laughs> i thought what you mean me okay fine um yeah so but i mean it was a, a an object lesson in you know i was trying you know jason was saying there's not enough money so i was trying to save money but uh you know luckily our fortunes improved so we weren't we didn't have to do that kind of thing i did i think i cut the budget slightly on the basis that it was 25 minute episodes and not 45 minute episodes <laughs> And of course, shortly after David Richardson came along, mm. the, the spin off started happening too. The Companion Chronicles, then we had uh, various box sets starting to come out. I think that I think there was Unit Dominion. That was one of the fir very first box sets, wasn't it? It might have been. Yeah, well, I certainly mm. remember it very well. I mean, you see, this is the thing the strength of David Richardson. You know, where I'd worked with David before at Visual Imagination, and whenever they wanted to do something new, they'd say, and I didn't really know David, they'd say, we, well, we must ask David Richardson, you know. Oh, okay, this guy who works freelance. And they and say, so, well, David thinks we should do this and this and this. And David was the one who always came up with new ideas, new strands, new titles, new magazines. And it, when he came into Big Finish, he saw himself as just being administrative, but I knew he loved Doctor Who. And I took an, you know, I, I'd known David sort of professionally and, and um, slightly earlier on during the publishing days. But then meeting him properly at the interview and, and, and chatting to him about the stuff, I knew that he loved Doctor Who and he really knew his stuff. You know, and I said, well, I think, you know, you can do creative stuff. And he said, well, that's that's not me. And I said, you know what a good story is, David. You know, I think I think you can. He never wanted to write anything or direct anything, but he wanted to be able to facilitate other people uh, to, you know, to come up with an idea for a strand and then go to writers and say, how about this? What do you make of that? You know, and he he very soon, you know, blossomed with all that. And you, you almost can't stop David coming up with uh, new ideas. Not that I'd ever want to stop him from coming up with new ideas. I had an email from him this morning over breakfast about a new idea for a series. Um, so yeah, it, it happens all the time. And, and David's been uh, just an amazing person uh, to work with. Um, we, we, I don't know why it works with us. Um, I think one of the reasons is we are able to have a disagreement, even a row, and find a way through. He's a very uh, wise and mature human being with bags of self-knowledge. And uh, I think we've helped each other through a lot of interesting times, you know, and he's, yeah, he's, it's interesting. We don't really see much of each other socially at all. I mean, of course, not for the last couple of years, but, you know, even then he's very much a goes home after the recording, doesn't come out for a drink. And, um, but yeah, I, I, I have, an indescribably uh, high esteem for him and feel a lot of warmth for him. He's a, he's, he's a human being I'm proud to know. Yeah, I certainly get a sense of, the, of his importance as an outsider looking in to Big Finish mm. as a consumer. Uh, he certainly had a massive impact on the company in the last dozen years or so. Oh, um, God, yes. And you, you, you get that through when you listen to the extras and, you, you know, people like Ken Bentley saying, oh, we we're walking along from Paddington Station and came up with this idea. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, a, a powerhouse for, for Big Finish. So, yeah. Definitely. And, you know, and has been so responsible for just the nuts and bolts of making everything happen, you know. Uh -huh. And also just the two, the two of us discuss things. We come to each other for help. I mean, I'm technically his manager, <laughs> but it feels quite often like he's my manager. Um, and I don't mind that. I don't, there's no, I don't think there's any competitiveness between, I'm not a competitive person. I hate all that rushing for the finish line to beat people. I hate all that. Um, and we, yeah, we, we seem to work really well together. We, 
occupy a lot of space in each other's uh, brain. <laughs> so, brains. Um, it's interesting. I only thought of one brain, like we've got the same brain. No, that's just mad. I, now, apart, I mean, Doctor Who for Big Finish is its its mainstay, but there's yes, lots yes. and lots of other ranges out there, lots of mm. original stuff as well, which I get a sense that Big Finish might like to do more originals, but if only there was more of an audience for it. Is that the is that the sense I get? I think that's fair. I mean, I think there's something unique about Doctor Who uh, and Big Finish together. I think we did it at a time when it had a chance of working. I wonder whether if a Big Finish started now, it might not be so successful. But we, I don't know, people needed Doctor Who and somehow Doctor Who fans, because many of them of that generation had audio recorded Doctor Who, listening to Doctor Who was uh, not an outlandish thing to do. Uh, whereas, you know, we weren't su so successful with Stargate. You thought Stargate's a massive international brand. People resented us for doing the audios uh, because it wasn't the TV show. So we never got that with Doctor Who, really. I mean, there's some people who will never listen to a Doctor Who audio play, and that's their loss. But, you know, uh, generally, Doctor Who fans are, are open to all forms of entertainment. And, with, and that makes them, I think... I know this is a sort of contradiction in terms, relatively unique. I'm sure there are other fandoms out there like that, but I think uh, there's something extremely special in the best possible way about Doctor Who fans. I'm being slightly arrogant because I am a Doctor Who fan. Um, yeah, we we were lucky. I, nothing has ever been su as successful for us as Doctor Who. You know, other things do really, really well. Uh, Space 1999 has done really well for us. That's what I'm working on um, you're stopping me from writing some Space 1999 scripts. That's, I'd like uh, to say I'm sorry, but not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm working on that at the moment. Is that Series 3 or Series 4? What's the last one that came out? Two. What? Two. Two. Well, it must be three then, mustn't it? Must be. Oh, oh, <laughs> it's wait, terrible, I, I don't know. I, don't know how, I mean, we don't know how far ahead. I mean, I mean that's part of the thing, that you've got some, some stuff in the can. You know, for yeah. years ahead, like the Tom Baker stuff coming out at the moment, you know, it's done oh, yeah. you know, 25 years ago. <laughs> um, I think that's a slight not, exaggeration. Okay, slight that. exaggeration. But I mean, they, they, you've got some stuff that sits in a can for a long time being released. And, you, you know, you, you know it, one of the successful things Big Finish does, I think, is your publicity. And I know you guard jealously, and I think rightly so, what you release when, because if everyone knew everything all the time, there'd be no drive. And I think that's yes. something. That's something that I'm sure frustrates, well, I know it frustrates a lot of fans, that they want to know everything right now. Um, well, I can yeah. talk about that. I mean, you've probably heard me talk about it on the Big Finish podcast. Hi there, Dwayne. Um, uh, by the way, it is the fourth series because the third series was Earthbound and that was that was out. Oh, you can't, you can't the first one by itself as the first series, do you? Yeah. The solo Appa okay. Apparently, according to the website that I'm looking at now, that <laughs> website called bigfinish.com, the important thing about marketing is that I don't want to keep secrets just for the sake of it, just to feel special. Uh, I'd like to tell everyone everything all the time. But the thing is, the best way to announce something is when everyone's looking. So, you know, you announce an announcement and then you announce it and it has a big impact and people, there's like a, it's like the roar of a crowd. You people all go, whoa, together. Whereas if you just let it leak out and some people just go, what? And then you do your announcement, a whole section of your audience go, I already know about that. And so the other ones who want to roar go, oh, is it something that people already know? So it loses impact. So the idea of keeping it special to a certain uh, you know, point in time is to get the best uh, reaction. And that best reaction, he says, like some awful capitalist, motivates people to buy stuff and that's you know big finish does not get a grant from anyone does not get a license fee we we just survive on the money that people pay for their cds and downloads so it's really important to get marketing right and i've struggled for many many years on the marketing front and we've had many full starts and gone up many blind alleys and drifted off into the corner and not paid enough attention to it but in the last couple of years with Steve Berry coming in as our head of marketing, you know, for the first time ever, we've got a proper marketing strategy. 
it's with with the money available it's really difficult to deliver and uh, and it's always a work in progress but you know in steve berry we've got someone who has such incredible vision and an uh, amazing instinct for what works and what doesn't and when something doesn't work quickly get rid of it move on you know um it, it, uh, it's a it's such an ever-changing landscape, though. I mean, you just think about the Doctor announcements. So you Matt Smith had a whole half an hour special where he was revealed at the last five minutes. Jody was just a sort of ad walking through the forest. Suti just done um, on Twitter with a couple of hashtags and went wild straight away. Um, it's changing yeah. all the time, isn't it? It's, how how yes. do you keep up with the ever-changing landscape and making sure you're well, that, there at the that's... right time? Well, that's Steve's job, you know, and he is really smart on all this. I mean, he never stops learning. He never stops reading stuff. He never stops, you know, surveying what's going on. He's always picking up on trends and he's always saying, this is uh, what we've got to do now is this, you know, or, you know, he, he is exactly the right person to be doing it. He, he's, he's a proper grown up and he is really knows his subject. Um, yeah, it, it's... Um, he is the one who's constantly, and you know, most of my work days are taken up with background conversations with Steve. You know, again, he's another person who I'm the manager of, so I have responsibility for him um, uh, and his well-being. And he's um, he's a rewarding and challenging person to be working with. You know, he's never going to let us sort of sit back on our laurels. He's always going to say, yeah, I know you think this works guys, but you've been doing this for five years now. And actually it's time to change. You know, how, how much is Jason involved in the day to day of what's happening? More than you think, probably. I think a lot of people think that he's just sort of, you know, the guy who, who owns the company and that's it. And the brilliant thing about him is that he does let us get on and create but he has quite a bit of input into the creative process. He never says, oh, no, no, don't do that. I don't know. Oh, he never micromanages us. But he often suggests ideas for things that really that are, that are always good and always pick up. Um, he's there to advise us on sort of policy matters, any difficulties that might occur. And he is really our main interface with the BBC in terms of discussing the license and all that kind of stuff. You know, our account manager at the BBC speaks to Jason mostly. Um, and also, you know, he's a friend, good friend. And occasionally, I mean, like next week, he's going to be doing a bit of directing for the first time in years for Big Finish. And, you know, I'm going to pop into London um, just to laugh and point at him. No, uh, to, to offer any help that I possibly can <laughs> and go out for a nice meal afterwards, hopefully. Um, so he is... Yeah, we, we consult him on a lot of things and, you know, and he would have far more meetings um, with us if he weren't so uh, caught up in other business matters. I mean, he is a businessman who runs a lot of companies and has a lot of interest in other companies. So you are quite often, you know, struggling to attract his attention. Um, but he, you know, his love and care for Big Finish is self-evident and uh, he's, yeah. It's just sometimes it might take five emails to, to get his attention rather than just one. And you have to make it a short one because, uh, you know, I had some leave recently that I had to take, otherwise I'd lose it, um, that had accrued over the pandemic. And um, the whole time I was on leave, he kept emailing me. And I said afterwards something about being on leave. And he said, oh, were you on leave? I said, yeah, you know that out of office notice you got every time you emailed me, <laughs> which detailed the dates when I was away and who you should contact instead of me? He said, oh, I, don't, I didn't read it. It was more than one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it said, you know, I'm away. It's the main thing it said. Yes. Well, there's so much more, Nick, that I'd like to talk to you about, like, Jekyll and Hyde, it's coming up ah. soon. You've got UFO coming out soon. Yeah, uh, the Just Human Frontier. Yeah. The, the, the Human Frontier is coming out very soon too. But Hopefully uh, not too soon because, you know, I haven't finished writing it yet. <laughs> haven't you? I thought it was Don't all- Don't make me feel stressed. Okay, sorry about that. But so we, I... we are looking forward to the human frontier. I know that. For okay. Fact. I just well, want to say, that... I finished, because I finished Sherlock Holmes yesterday for the, you know, in preparation for today, I thought one of the, the latest, the um, fiends from New York. Um, I finished I it today to, too. <laughs> I, I just want to say uh, how sensational um, that is. And in terms of Sherlock Holmes, I mean, the writing is superb. I mean, you know, it's just. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan's the last, brilliant. Yeah. Jonathan's brilliant. And the last few box sets have just been out of this world. I love what he's done with the last two in particular because 
it's all character driven and there's this plot line behind things but it's not a big case to solve but it's all about people and situation and it's brilliantly done um but i think i've, I've mentioned you know you know some of my reviews in terms of the voice of sherlock holmes now is you um thank and you that's very and, nice and you know i love it when you get enough opportunities to act i mean i think all your dalek is acting as well um but in terms of but- characterizations too there's just something slightly different uh, about that, and I, just, you know, having just listened to it and having you in my ears for the last couple of days has just been sensational. So thank you for all that you do with Sherlock oh, Holmes. Oh, thank you. It's it's a wonderful to do it, uh, and I can't w- wait to get back in the studio and be there with Richard Earl, who plays Watson, who is one of my favourite human beings. He is such a. I mean, if you heard him interviewed, he just his sense of humour is just. I wish I could. Oh. He, did, he recorded a fantastic, uh, loads of people recorded fantastic messages for me for my 60th birthday, just holding the glass up again for anyone who's watching. That's my 60th birthday glass. And, you know, his I play his video message to so many people because it's just, um, I, I, I can't play it to you because it's too rude, but uh, he basically <laughs> likens me to a bridge and he happened to be on location filming something and he he just showed me this bridge. And he said, like you, it lets people walk all over it and like you, and <laughs> it's, it's really, really funny. Um, and he is a delightful human being. And I just, it's lovely to play Sherlock Holmes. It's a real um, challenge and um and a delightful it's a it's a moment where I can totally indulge myself in a character and not worry about all the other stuff. You know, you can leave that firmly in the hands of Ken Bentley, the director, Emma Haig, who's producing it these days, and Jonathan Barnes, who knows his Sherlock Holmes inside out. Never have any quibble with the scripts. Just bring it on. Let's do it. I love it. Well, I'd, I'd love more. So, yeah, <laughs> there, the there will be more good with more in the pipeline right now. Well, can I just say, Nick, thanks so much for uh, taking some time to chat with us today. It's been uh, fantastic to get some of your insights uh, into the Thank you. into your history. Have and, I said uh, too much? I feel like I've revealed too much about myself. <laughs> too too late. late now. Too late. Too late. It's out there. But if, if I can speak for every Big Finish fan out there, uh, thank you so much for all that you do. We really enjoy everything or mostly everything that uh, comes through our ears and Except for the um, stuff that you really hate yes that's it you'll find me tweeting about it tomorrow uh but can i just say for on behalf of us all thank you for what you do we really appreciate it. oh thank you Dwayne, and we really appreciate what you guys do as well it's a lovely podcast and i know so many contributors have been on and had a lovely time from big finish productions sherlock holmes the fiends of New York City. You do have a case then? Or at least the glimmerings of one? Perhaps. Certainly not more than an hour ago, I received a communication of a decidedly curious kind. The message came from an American gentleman who sports the rather splendid name of Ephraim Gill. The truth is so grisly that I hardly know where best to begin. He means to call upon me imminently and to engage me, he says, upon a certain matter which has to do with the nature of evil itself. A wretched and savage business, don't you think? A dreadful and an infamous crime. Her throat had been cut from side to side, and her face had been painted white all over. That poor woman. The work of a devil. <laughs> Give it up, man! <laughs> <laughs> Worse even than that, Doctor, as we three sit here jawing and swapping theories, that fiend has settled into an apartment on Baker Street just a short walk along the way. Order! I will have order! Would the Prime Minister agree with me that this nation stands at present upon a point of crisis when it comes to all matters concerned with crime? There is some evil in that building, some treachery, which I do not at present understand. Sherlock, there is evil everywhere. Such is the nature of the world. But what I have to say to you might affect the very soul of our nation. I want a piece of information. I fear that I must upon this occasion, and with regret, decline your invitation. There you make the same mistake as so many others have before you. 
And what mistake might that be? To believe that I am offering you a choice. Big finish for the love of stories. Well, a big thanks to Nicholas Briggs for joining us. And uh, it was great to have that discussion, wasn't it, Phil? Yeah, it was. So thankful Nicholas found the time. Uh, we, we would have been happy with half an hour and he put aside <laughs> a couple of hours for us. Um, very, very thankful. Learned so much. Mind you, I just think we've already just touched the surface. There's so much stuff we didn't cover, which we still could. So hopefully it won't be too long before we get him back again and can yeah, drill, drill a bit more into that brain. Hmm. All right. At the outset of the show today, we spoke about some recommendations over the last couple of months. Let's come up with our regular recommendations for the show. And what I'd like to... No, oh, I can't do it, Philip. It's your turn. Okay. Let me jump in and go then if it's my turn. Uh, I'm going to recommend one of the Out of Time, um, as I said two months oh. ago. So the Out of Time box sets with David Tennant. He's done three now. Yep. Um, so Peter Davison and Tom Baker and now Colin Baker. Um, this one's called Wink. And so it's it's a... It's a um, I was going to say sequel, that's the wrong word, but it's, it's using the angels. Um, it's by Lisa McMullen. Lisa has done... She, boy, she's writing so well. So I'm so impressed by Lisa McMullen's writing, and she just keeps writing better and better all the time. Um, it's out of time. It's Colin Baker, David Tennant, dealing with angels. There's some timey-wimey stuff thrown in as well. You've got to have timey-wimey with angels, don't you? Um, it's a fascinating concept because you've got a whole planet of people who are blind because it's always so light. So it's it's, it's this fascinating concept. The doctors, Both the doctors turn up to this planet because once every, I forget what it is, 70 years or something, the there's it gets dark, dim enough that normal people can see there. The rest of the time it is so bright, everyone's blind, and all the inhabitants are blind. And so you've got a whole population of blind people with angels um, and two doctors arriving, and it's all going to be disaster. But it's very, very cleverly done. Colin Baker and David Tennant work off each other so well. Um, I love both their doctors. I love both these actors. And it's, it is just great fun. Have you have you listened to it? I have. Do you yeah, enjoy fantastic. It? The way they spark off each other is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I, we, we all love multi-doctor stories, don't we? And there's good reason. And when you can write them this well, it's, it's, it's worth having. Um, yeah, I think people probably don't have too many because it'd spoil you at the moment. I'm, I love being spoiled. Uh, and I'm really hoping that there's some more out of time that happens. Um, though I guess David Tennant's a bit busy at the moment filming Doctor Who. But I'm hoping that we'll still get some more stuff down the track with maybe some more Doctors. Now, what about you, Duane? What, are, what have you been listening to and what do you recommend? Okay. Now, we uh, did our interview with Nicholas Briggs a couple of months before we or at least a month before we recorded this, or is it two? It is two. Um, and we're recording now, sadly, uh, a day or so after uh, we found out the news that David Warner had passed away. So, of course, that's uh, very sad. Um, but it is is wonderful that he's done so much work for Big Finish. And I had the urge to listen to something because I was sort of, I was feeling really sad for, for Lisa, Lisa as well. So I dug out a Bernice Summerfield uh, volume six, Lost in Translation, and listened to that um, uh, over the last day. And there is one particular story on there. It's called Inertia, written by James Goss. And if you don't listen to any other story, listen to that one. It is virtually a two-hander uh, with David and Lisa. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece. It's quirky. It's funny. It's got the James Goss uh, feel to it um, in in the script. But they, but Lisa and David, obviously they knew each other well, and they spark off each other well in this setting as well. It was really lovely to hear it, and um, yeah, it gave me gave me some nice nice warm feelings after the sadness of uh, of hearing the news. So uh, so yeah. The New Adventures of Bernice Summerfield, Volume 6, Lost in Translation. That would be my recommendation for, for this time. It's a great choice. It's a lovely story and some great acting. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, have no doubt we will be uh, coming back to revisit uh, some of David Warner's work on The Sirens of Audio in due course. Mm. That only leaves me to say thank you so much, Philip, for, uh, for your company. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in your presence once again. 
my absolute pleasure and my pleasure to be in your presence as well, Dwayne. So thanks a lot. Right. Now let's get back to our families. Okay. Catch you next time. Good luck. See everyone. (laughs) This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 121, Finishing Big, with our guest Nicholas Briggs and your host Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Contact us or check out all our details at sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or post a comment on our socials or our YouTube channel and let us know your thoughts on this or any one of our episodes. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.